Welcome to virtual GED class. We're continuing to work through um, how to understand word problems. And what we're going to look at today is visualizing word problems. I've got a real issue with GED students. No offense. I love you guys. You know you're my favorite. But one of the issues I have is that when you guys are faced with an unfamiliar word problem, when you're not sure what to do, you often use the stare real hard at it method where you just kind of stare at the question, furrow your brow and look upset. And some of y'all start crying, you know, uh, but you don't do anything. So one of the things that we could do is try to draw a picture, to visualize what's going on in the word problem. That can often help us figure it out. So we're gonna look at just a large variety of word problems today um, from all over map, all different things. Some things you may have seen before, some things you may have not. Uh, that's not the point. The point here today is just that we're gonna practice drawing pictures to help us understand. Um, I'm just gonna define that word to visualize and all I mean with that is to uh, create an image or a diagram, a chart, uh, in order to better understand a word problem. Some kind of visual representation of what's going on. Let me not use the word visual when I define visualization. How about that? Some kind of image to represent what's going on. Okay, sweet. Uh, just like we've been doing as we've been looking at these word problem skills, um, we are going to just get into it and look at using this skill in a ton of different ways. Y'all, I am a mathematician, not an artist, so you guys are gonna have to give me a little bit of a break with my pictures, okay? But let's go ahead and take a look. Number one says, Fluvia purchased three notebooks at a cost of $3.49 each. She bought two boxes of pencils at $4.97 each and a GED calculator for $17.99 each. What is the total cost of her purchases before tax? Now, this is a super simple example because these videos are going to be watched by tons of different peoples at tons of different skill levels. But what I'm looking at today is this idea of being able to visualize a word problem. So I'm just going to kind of sketch out what I have going on here, okay? And then I'm looking at Fluvia purchasing three notebooks. So I'm just going to go ahead here. And for my students who really struggle with what to do in a word problem, sketching these things out can help you. So I've got my little three notebooks, and each one of those is 340. And I'm going to go ahead and label it up, 349. We also said we bought two boxes of pencils. And I just want to warn you guys, GED students tend to skip over numbers that are spelled out. So don't be the student who does that, okay? If I have three notebooks, I need to account for it three times. My two boxes of pencils, of course, at 497 each. Now some of you guys are like, why is she doing this with such a simple problem? I wouldn't need a diagram for that. That's okay. We have everything from very simple to very complex problems today, okay? So there's my um, two boxes of pencils at $4.97 each, and then I have my little GED calculator at $17.99 apiece. And I'm asking for the total cost of her purchases. I want you guys to put all these purchases together. Now, with, whether you have this diagram or not, now, Richard, you get to chime in. What did you want me to do with all these numbers, Richard? Add them all together. You want me to add them all together. So like add 349 plus 349 plus 349? Well, you could multiply those times I three. I sure but... could. Richard knows that there's two ways. I could do repeated addition or I could do multiplication, but I'll just do it your first way. I'll add them all together. I'll add all my 349s, I'll add in my two 497s, and I'll add in my 1799. And yes, I got this out of my calculator, 38.4. Help me make sense of this number. This is 38.4 what? Dollars. Wonderful. If I want money to make sense, I either use no decimal places or two decimal places. So I'll plop a zero back there to make sense of it. Then we do get 38 dollars and. 40 cents. Super simple example to ease into this visualizing word problems topic. Again, we're trying to picture everything we're doing today. Number two, a certain room is 217 square feet. If the length of the room is 15.5 feet, what is the width of the room. But again, before I answer this, I want to draw a picture of what's going on here. Guys, what should I draw? What would my room look like? 
any ideas? Like I'm looking, I'm in a room right now. It's a pretty small room, but I'm looking around and my room is, um, it's a rectangle. Uh, um, most rooms, unless we specifies otherwise, are usually roughly rectangular. And then I know some information here that I can label it. I know that the room is 217. Do you remember what square feet are? Yes. Um, the size of the whole thing. Inside. Yeah, the size of the whole thing. We call that the... Yeah, square foot is one by one. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can you explain to me a little bit? One square foot equals one foot by one foot. You're picturing a square foot. that's one on each side. Right. Is that what you meant? Okay, I understand what you mean. Let me just draw what Richard is saying. He's saying that a square foot is a square that is one foot by one foot. And of course, as Richard knows, if you go all the way around, all those sides are the same, but it's still a one foot by one foot square. So that's how many, if I were to cover up this whole big rectangle here, I would cover this with 217 of those square feet that Richard is picturing. Okay, wonderful. Now I know one other number. It says the length of the room is 15.5 feet. The length of the room, where should I put that? It's the long part of your rectangle. Sure, it actually doesn't matter with which one's lengths are with, but yeah, it's one of the sides of my rectangle for sure. And it's, I think it is the longer part on this one. We have the measuring square feet, and then we have in feet. What is the difference? Okay, good question. A regular foot is a linear foot. It's a line. Think of like what we measure on a ruler. You're measuring how long the line is. Square foot is a covering. It's yeah. literally a square that like Richard described as a foot by foot. You would use it to cover up a T 2D shape. So we use feet to talk about how long lines are. So I'm talking about a line here when I talk about the length, so I say feet. Uh, but I use square feet to talk about how big a space, like a covering is, a 2D space. So when I wanna cover it up, I use square feet. So I just co colored that rectangle so you could see what I meant. Okay, now let's look at what we're looking for. The question here says, what is the width of the room? What is the width? So looking at my diagram, where's that width that I'm trying to find? Yeah, Richard's going like this. It's that other line. Yeah, it's the height that you have here. Cool. And that's going to be in regular feet because see how it's just a line? So when we talk about the squares, how do we get the idea of square feet? I'm going to come over here and just visualize another thing. Since this isn't an area day, I'm not going to do it by with the formula or any other way. I'm just afraid of doing do it with pictures. So I want you guys to look at this simpler picture over here. Richard, come look at this picture with me. Um, how many little squares did I cover this sucker with? Well, I have one, two, three, four, five. 15. Yes, absolutely. 15 in this case, square units. And I can see that it's one, two, three, four, five squares long. So how many squares wide is it? Three. Three. It's a three by five. Yeah. How can I combine those numbers three and five to get to 15? Of course, I could multiply. Three times five is 15. But I have a problem over here, of course. I only know the length. I don't know the width. So I'm going to have to work backwards. I'm going to have to do the opposite of multiplying. Remember what the opposite of multiplying is? Divide. Dividing. I'm going to take that answer, as I think of it, the 217, divide by the side that I know, 15.5, and I'm going to see that I would have to be 14 squares high. My width would have to be 14 feet. Just like I could have done over here, we didn't have to because we could have counted, but we could have started with the 15 squares, the 15 squares, divided by the fact that there were five columns, and we would have seen that there would be three rows. It's this working backwards idea. So I did the same thing here. I started with the 217 square feet. I divided by the fact that I had 15 and a half, I would have had 15.5 rows uh, to get the 14 feet and worked backwards. Does that make sense, Richard? Totally makes sense, and that's the answer that I got. Sweet. Only I didn't do it backwards, I just did it 15.5 times 14. Oh, so you said to yourself, what number times 15.5 would give me 217? Right, and I multiplied the 15 by 2, and then I came up with, you know, but I got the answer. Yeah, so you kind of did a guess and check method with what number would I need to multiply, and that's brilliant. Um, but a quick way to do that, to not have to guess and check, would be to just divide. So great, 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 great. And you know, I don't care what method you use to solve it. And that's not even what we're focusing on today. What we're focusing on today is the visualization of these things. Number three, number three typically very frequently comes up on the non-calculator section of the GED. They like applications of number line problems and applications of absolute value. And this is both. Uh, but that being said, we don't have to know too much about this to visualize it. 
So I want to draw a picture to help everybody see your work and explain why you're doing what you're doing. So the answer is great, but today I'm focused on images. So it says without a calculator, we're going to find the distance on a number line between negative 1.2 and 4.6. So let's get a number line out. Let's remember that on a number line, um, we always go to the right to get greater. So 4.6 is going to be somewhere to the right here of zero. And then as we get smaller, we go up to the left. So negative 1.2 is going to be on that side of zero. Now, a lot yes. of students aren't sure what to do to find the distance. They're like, sometimes it feels like distance is subtracting. And sometimes in the end, I feel like I'm adding, Kate. And I get really confused about this. And I, I clarify that in another class. Go check out the absolute value class if you want to see it. But for now, we're just going to look at this picture. Because I think that everybody knows the distance from here to here. This piece is really easy to think about. What's the distance between 0 and 4.6? 4.6. It's 4.6. Yeah. Richard's like, duh. Of course it's 4.6. And now I want to look at this piece here. What is the distance between 0 and negative 1.2? How far is negative 1.2 from zero. We talked about this the day we talked about absolute value and distance, but we said distance is always positive. <laughs> I never say to you, how far did you go to the store? Nobody ever says to me, Kate, I walked negative 500 feet. If I'm talking distance, it's positive. So if this distance is 4.6 and this distance is 1.2, and we see both of those distances between, I could go ahead and add them up like Mary Sella was doing. And of course, my 6 tenths and my 2 tenths give me 8 tenths, and my five, 4 and my 1 give me 5. And so I see a total distance of 5.8 units. Another problem that commonly comes up on the GED that we could visualize. So if they say, what's the distance on a number line? Don't stop without drawing me a number line, y'all. And you could avoid some really silly common mistakes that students make. So okay. here we go, number four. <laughs> A certain paint color is mixed using one part gray paint, two parts blue paint, and five parts white paint. For his building project, Jack needs 40 total quarts of paint. How many quarts of each paint color will he need? Now, I got to tell you, a lot of students just stare at this. They try to remember what their math teacher taught them. And they do a lot of weird things and they never bother to draw a picture. And I just feel like we could really easily draw a picture here. Okay, whenever you have a ratio and proportion, um, pictures can be your friend. Okay, so a certain paint color is mixed using one part gray paint. So I'm just gonna come over here with one part uh, gray paint. Okay, now two parts blue paint. So I'm gonna draw the same size, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and label these blue paint and then five parts of white paint. So I'll get myself little five little W's. And so I have this really great visual representation of this paint mixing. Now I see it says for his building project, Jack needs 40 total quarts of paint. Take a look at that statement. It says Jack needs 40 total quarts of paint. When I say 40 total quarts of paint, am I talking about the gray paint, the blue paint, the white paint? What am I talking about? Everything. Everything, all together. Exactly right. So the gray, the blue, and the white. So let's look at my little diagram. If I'm talking everything here, let's look. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right now, I have eight. I would have to repeat this diagram a few times. Imagine I did another row. Gray, blue, blue, white, 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 white. Now I have 16, and we can imagine that those parts are quarts, 16 quarts of paint. And I can keep repeating this relationship. And that's what we learned when we did the ratio unit, that these ratios are just repeated relationships. We're just seeing the same relationship over and over. So I can keep repeating this relationship, the one part gray, two parts blue, and five parts white. And now I have 8, 16, 24. And I'm just going to keep going like that. Now I'm up to 32 parts, and I didn't really give myself enough room. I'll put another line down here. And you can see now, can you see that I have 40 parts of paint? 8, 16, 24, 32, 40 parts of paint. I have 40 letters down here. So now I have this kind of visual representation. I didn't even use any math proportions or ratios or any of the things that I've used uh, in the past. And I can just go ahead and figure out how many parts of gray, how many parts of blue, and how many parts of white by counting up my letters here. So how many parts of gray paint do I end up with? Five. Five. How about the blue? Ten. Ten. And the white? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. 5, 10, 15, 20, yeah, 25. So how many uh, quarts of each paint color will I need? Five quarts of gray, 
12 quarts of blue and 25 quarts of white. Let's look at number five. You are conducting a survey about the environmental impact of a wind energy farm. If the proposed windmills have blades that form a circle 32 meters in diameter, find the area of space swept by the spinning blades of the windmill. The GED loves problems like this. And again, I just it just makes me so sad when students just sit and stare at it and don't try anything. This is a really visual picture. I have something going on. Let's try to draw it. What are we looking at? We're saying we have a windmill. Guys, what's a windmill look like? A propeller. Okay, it definitely has a propeller going on. A circle. And Richard's realizing that the propellers will spin, forming a circle. Now, I know something about this windmill. It says, my windmills have blades that form a circle 32 meters in diameter. That's a math vocab word. If you don't know what that means, we're going to be in trouble. Does anybody know what the word diameter means? The length from one side of the circle to the other through the center. Exactly right. R Richard's got it memorized. Nice job. So it is, yes, the length from one side of the circle to the other, if and only if you go through the center. If I draw the diameter, I'm going to go through the center here, but I'm going to go all the way from one end of my circle to the other. So my diameter is 32 meters. Let's look at what they want us to find. They want us to find the area of the space swept by the spinning blades. So they want us to find area, but the area of what? What shape did you tell me these blades formed, Richard? A circle. A circle. Wonderful. So we are being asked to find the area of a circle. Now, I warned you today's problems. We're going to go to every topic we've covered in GED math so far. Richard's at a disadvantage. He just joined us. Do you know, Richard, you're not at a disadvantage? You know how to find the area of a circle, sir? Yes. Uh, you take the radius squared times pi. Beautiful. So Richard's got the formula memorized. But for the rest of us who don't have that formula memorized, check out your GED formula sheet. Remember you get that. Look under that very first section, that area section, and you'll see it says just what Richard said. The area of a circle is equal to pi times the square of the radius. Now let's plug in what we know here and watch out. I'm trying to trick you. It says to find the area. We're trying to find the area. We're going to multiply pi. Now, 3.14 is not exactly pi, but it's a close enough approximation for the GED. And that is also on your formula sheet if you forget that number. So I plug in 3.14 for pi. And now I'm supposed to plug in the radius and square it. And we've got a problem. Yeah, you don't know the radius. Yeah, they didn't give me what I need. I always joke the GED is not your mama. They're not here trying to give you what you need, okay? So instead of giving me the radius, they gave me the diameter. So we said a diameter goes from side to side through the center. That's a diameter. But what is a radius? Half the diameter. It is. The radius only goes from the center out. So the radius is just half of that diameter. If I wanted to take this 32 meters and take half half of it, uh, one quick way I could do that is to divide by two. 32 divided by two and my radius would be just 16 meters. So I'm going to plug in a 16 here, not a 32. I'm not just going to assume they gave me what I needed. And now I can simplify this entire thing in my TI calculator because it's all numbers. So 3.14 times 16 squared uh, gives me an area of 803.84. Did I have any rounding directions here? Let's see. Find the area of space swept by the spinning blades of the windmill. I didn't give you any rounding directions. I didn't say to the nearest square meter, to the nearest tenth of a square meter. I gave you no rounding directions. So if this was on the GED, uh, it would be multiple choice. But we'll just finish it off then with a unit. So what would the unit be if I was measuring area? Well, you guys talked about that back in problem number two. What kind of units do I measure area in? Do either of you remember? You were doing it with a rectangle earlier, but when you wanted to cover up this rectangle, you covered it up with squares. When I'm finding the area of a circle, I'm just covering, I'm figuring out how many square units would cover that circle. So this is 803.84 square meters. Can we do that with circles? Yeah, that's why you have to use the formula, Maricela. That's okay. why 3.14159, that's why pi is so ugly. Because you know if I draw a circle, I'm not going to have a perfect number of squares to cover it. Like in the middle, it'll be pretty perfect. But as I start getting to the edges, 
it's not going to be so perfect anymore. I get parts of squares and parts of squares, and that's why it's such funky numbers, and we end up rounding so much when it comes to circles. And that's also the reason that either you need to be like Richard and have the circle formulas memorized, lucky you, or you need to know where to find them on the formula sheet, because you're not going to be able to figure out circles without formulas, because it's just not perfect with those circles. We got pieces and parts of squares all over the place. I just had one question. I mean, my answer was 803.84, but mm -hmm. I didn't put the square meter. So anytime I guess you're doing an area like you underlined here, find the area of space, it has to be in some form of a area measurement squared. Exactly. It'll be square meters or square yards or square feet. But right. the good news is on the GED, it's usually just multiple choice. So if you don't have that memorized, it's not the end of the world. But yes, area is always measured in square units. I co-taught under a woman who was a brilliant woman. I'm, I was lucky to teach under her. But she used to make her students say squaria, squaria, so that they could remember that area is always measured in square units. Paul's sock drawer contains five pairs of argyle socks, 10 pairs of white socks, and five pairs of black dress socks. Find the likelihood that Paul, reaching into the drawer and drawing out a pair at random, draws out a pair of black dress socks. I'm not going to draw all these socks because I'm too lazy, but I'll just make them bald, okay? There's a ball of argyle socks, and I know this man has five pairs of argyle socks, so I'm just kind of visualizing this. I've got ten pairs of white socks, and then I have five pairs of black socks. Now, I could put the five pairs of black socks on the bottom, but I'm actually going to put them up here because I like looking at it as one cohesive unit. It doesn't really matter where you do it, but it, for me, it's easier to visualize when I see this nice array with all the same numbers of socks in each row. Now, we're finding the likelihood. Uh, that's a word that we haven't used since the data analysis unit. Anybody know what likelihood means? The probability. It's like, how possible is it? How, how likely is this to happen? Is it for sure going to happen? Or is it not probably going to happen? <laughs> I want to know what's probability in Spanish. Probabilidad. It's almost the same. Oh, it's lo mismo. <laughs> Now, the interesting thing about probability, though, is that we learned that it's always ranked from zero to one. Zero is it's never going to happen, no way. One is it's always going to happen every time. And so students tell me all the time, Kate, there's no numbers between zero and one. And I'm like, there's a whole lot of numbers between zeros and one. What kind of numbers are we going to use to get pieces and parts? Fractions are the most common, but we could also use decimals or percents. So we're going to use fractions here because that's what's usually used for probability. So we're looking for <laughs> the probability, the likelihood that he reaches in and pulls out a pair of black dress socks. The man's got five pairs of black dress socks. Yes. Yeah, but remember when we did probability, we said it was from a zero to one. We're going to do a fraction. So that's five pairs of black dress socks, but out of how many total? You always compare it to the total when you're doing probability. So five out of how many? 20. Where'd you get the number 20, Maricela? Because it's the total of socks that we yeah, have. Yeah, that's all the, the socks. She's just looking at, there's 10 and 10 more, that's 20. Uh, that being said, even though this answer is true and it is correct. It is not the answer that would be on the GED. Uh, all final fraction answers are supposed to be reduced. I haven't even taught you how to reduce fractions in this class. In fact, for you guys who are actually enrolled in my virtual GED class, I just say, do fractions on Odyssey where they're not that big of a deal to the GED. Uh, why? Because there's two ways to reduce this fraction. I could just type it into my calculator. To put that into the calculator, I would just press that N over D button. I would type five on the top, 20 on the bottom, and I'd press enter, and it would tell me that five over 20 reduces to one fourth. Now what I'd like to say is you can actually visualize this. That's one of the reasons I wanted to write my thing this way. Take a look at this with my picture. If I take my 20, I could break it into four equal groups. Yeah, this group of the five argyle socks, this group of the five black socks, and then two groups of white socks. That's, that's four equal groups of five pairs of socks. And of them, one out of those four groups is black. And we can see just this really clear visualization of why five over 20 is the same as one out of four. It's the same relationship. A grandfather clock has a minute hand nine inches in length. Find the distance traveled by the tip of the minute hand over the course of three hours. What am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at the face of a clock, huh? Face of a clock is generally circular, and I want a minute hand that's nine inches in length. So what does a minute hand look like? Well, the minute hand usually starts at the center here and goes pretty much towards the end of the 
clock here. And they tell me my minute hand is nine inches long. They want me to figure out what distance is the tip of the minute hand, so there's the tip of the minute hand right there, is going to travel over the course of three hours. Okay, so what would happen to the minute hand of a clock over the course of three hours? Well, let's bring it back to an hour. What happens to the minute hand of a clock in an hour? It goes around in a circle. It goes around in a circle. So there, in one hour, it goes in a circle. Well, what's gonna happen in a second hour? It's gonna go in another circle. And then in a third hour, it's gonna go in another circle. So I think this, the tip of the minute hand is going to travel in three circles. Three hours, three circles. Whether we're good at geometry or we're just good at looking at the GED formula sheet, there's a couple of different things going on with circles. There's both the circumference of a circle and there's the area of a circle. So we've got to just visualize the tip of that minute hand. We're talking about the distance traveled by the tip of the minute hand. Does that tip of the minute hand travel the circumference of a circle or the area of a circle? Remember that area covers an entire shape. That minute hand is not going to cover up the entire area. That minute hand is going to go around the circle. The word for going around the circle is the circumference. Do you hear how circumference kind of sounds like fence? That's how I remember it. Often also draw these diagrams for my student. Area covers, circumference goes around. My little tip of my minute hand would go around, so I'm looking for the circumference of this circle. Circumference, area, either of those things, I would hit up my GED formula sheet. And if you were to look at your GED formula sheet, where would you find circumference? Well, you find it in the perimeter section, the second section down. Why is it down there? Because perimeter is a line around the outside of a shape. So circumference is just the special name for the perimeter of a circle. And you're gonna see that you have choices. The circumference line looks like this. It says C equals pi D or C equals two pi. And then it has a little colon here and tells you what pi is equivalent to. I don't know why they choose to do it right there, but that's where they choose to do it. Okay, so it looks confusing to a lot of students. And they say, well, which one should I do? Should I do C equals pi D, Kate, or should I do C equals two pi R? And I say, well, we're lazy. We are lazy mathematicians. We should do whichever one makes our life easier. So do we have the D, the diameter of the circle, or do we have the R, the radius of the circle? Which one do we have when we labeled this minute hand? You actually have both. Yeah, Richard knows that I'm smart enough to have both, so I could really use either. But which one do I have right now that's directly stated, Richard? The radius. The radius, exactly. From the center to the outside, that radius is nine inches. Because my minute hand goes from the center to the outside, it is a radius. So I could go ahead and use this formula, C equals two pi R, and that's what I'll do. So C is equal to the number two times pi, which is 3.14, times that radius, which is nine inches. And I find that the circumference of my circle is two times 3.14 times nine. And I got 56.52. And I got to tell you, a lot of students stop right here. So proud of themselves. So what was that last thing you told me you wanted to do with this number, Richard? I wanted to multiply it by the three rotations. Bingo. In three hours, that hand is going around three times. So I need to multiply that sucker by the three rotations. If I do that entire circumference three times, that will be that distance. 56.52 three times. And I'll do it in my GED calculator because I'm so lazy. Uh, 169.56. And let's see if I have any rounding directions. Find the distance. No, I didn't include any rounding directions again. So once again, it would be multiple choice. But this is 169.56 inches. Now, eight is a problem that a lot of teachers will teach you to do with algebra, which is fine. I, I, loved, I would do this with algebra myself because I'm proficient in algebra. But a lot of students struggle with algebraic word problems. So can we do this with a picture? We can. Let's take a look. It says, Lacey was sent to the bank to get change for the registers in her store. She came back with a total of $925 in 10 bundles of bills. If a bundle of $1 bills contains 25 bills, a bundle of $5 bills contains 20 bills, and a bundle of 10s contains 25 bills, which of the following could be the number of bundles of each bill that she brought? I've got some multiple choice answers here that I could try visualizing. So I'm just going to do that with A. A gives me three bundles of ones, a bundle of fives, and three bundles of tens. We know that we're supposed to have $925 in 10 bundles of bills. I think A is a stupid answer. Anybody see why A is just dumb? 
There's only seven bundles. There's only seven bundles. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven bundles. I was supposed to have 10. Duh. That is not going to work. Anybody else see? There's another one that's just a stupid answer. D. Okay, let me try. Two bundles of ones, four bundles of fives, and four bundles of tens. Well, it doesn't look right away stupid because I do actually have 10 bundles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm cool with that. It's 10 mm -hmm. bundles of bills, but I know that those bundles have to equal a total of $925. So let's start looking at our bundles. Well, we said a bundle of $1 bills contains... 25 bills. Uh, $50. Yes, they're each worth 25 so I heard you say $50. Then how much is our bundle of $5 bills going to be worth? Well, take a look here. It says a bundle of $5 bills contains... 20 bills. Five dollar bills, so each bill is worth five dollars, and there's 20 of them. How much money am I looking at there? A hundred dollars. Yes, yes, exactly. Five dollars happening 20 times gives me a bundle that's worth a hundred dollars. Cool, I'm gonna label each one of those with a hundred dollars. Now let's look at our four bundles of tens. So we had our four bundles of fives and now our four bundles of tens. Okay, so what do they tell me about tens? They say a bundle of tens contains 25 bills. 250 for each. Exactly. $10 happening 25 times would give me $250 per bundle. So yep, Mary Stella sees it right away. These are each worth $250. Now this kind of reminds me of the problem at the beginning. I don't care if you add it up repeatedly or multiply. As Richard pointed out, I could do it either way. I'll do it through multiplying because I'm a lazy mathematician. So 25, two times, so 25 times two, plus a hundred times four. What are you going to say, Maricela? Are you saying I'm already, know that I'm wrong? Even if we, if we just do with the 250, we're over, <laughs> we're over already. So we don't have to do that like, okay, Look, Kate, look, Kate, you don't need to do all that math. <laughs> Look at that 254 times. That'd be a thousand bucks already. I'm way over 925. And this is a stupid answer. And maybe that's why she wanted to rule it out from the beginning. That was the lazy way to do that one first. <laughs> it absolutely <laughs> is. And I have to tell you guys, mathematicians are lazy as can be. We are efficiently lazy, okay? We try to do as little work as possible and still be right. <laughs> okay, beautiful. So I rolled out D. What do you guys want me to do now? Shall I picture B or shall I picture C? Go for C. <laughs> So you can rule that out real fast. C only has 13 bundles. I can totally rule out C. It's got too many bundles. Nine ones and then two fives and two tens. Yeah, I'm up to 13 bundles. That is way too many. So yes, absolutely. Let's go ahead and picture B to make sure it works. So we have five bundles of one. How much did you guys tell me a bundle of ones was worth? $25. $25. And then how about a bundle of fives again? $100. 100 And those tens? 250 250, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 925. Woohoo! B work. Shall we look at number nine? Now, number nine is not something that you guys would necessarily draw a picture for, so I'm going to show you a little technique. So this might be totally new to you. Three friends collect baseball cards. The second friend has three times as many cards as the first friend. The third friend has 100 more than the first friend. Together, they own 850 cards. And I want to know how many cards does each friend have. Again, this is something very easily solved with algebra. But because so many students struggle with algebra, I also want to give you a visual representation of this, OK? So we've got three friends. Uh, let's call them the first friend, the second friend, and the third friend, like our word problem did. So let's take a look at this. It says, the second friend has three times as many cards as the first friend. Now, we have a problem, though. We don't know how many cards the first friend has. But this is what we can do. We can put a little shape to represent the first friend. Here's the first friend's cards. How many ever they are, I don't know but there's a box to represent that. So now I can use this box to represent the second friend. Notice that it says the second friend has three times as many cards as the first friend. Three times as many. So even though I don't know how many that is, I know I can represent that with three of these boxes. And there's a visual representation of the second friend having three times as much as the first friend. Cool, now let's look at the third friend. It says the third friend has 100 more than the first friend. The third friend has 100 more than the first friend. So, you know, he has like the same as the first friend, but not exactly the same. He has a hundred more. 
So I just put that box like the first friend ha has, but then I gave him a hundred more. You guys cool with that? Now together, all of these total up to 850 cards because it says together they own 850 cards. Now I want to try to figure out how many cards each friend has. Now, how can I conceptualize this? I have all of this stuff here, these five boxes and this 100 equaling up to 850 cards. So let's see, five boxes and 100 equals a total of 850 cards. Well, I kind of feel like we already know about the 100. We could just kind of ignore it. So if the five boxes plus that extra 100 equals 850 cards, how much is the five boxes alone equal to, you guys? 750. 750. Yeah, we could take that 100 cards out, and I wouldn't have 850. I would just have 750. So those five boxes alone would equal 750. And I didn't really give myself enough room, so I'll come up here. Just those five boxes. How'd you get from 850 to 750? Because we already know the 100. Yeah, I took out that 100. I took that 100 out of my total because I already know it. Cool. And now, Mary Sally, you said you want me to divide. What do you want me to divide by? Um, 750 divided by 5. Absolutely. If each one of those boxes is worth the same amount, I can just take that 750 and I can break it into five equal pieces. Divide by 5. And I'll find out that each one of these boxes is worth 150. Cool. Now we have enough information to go back and figure out what each friend had. So the first friend had how many cards? 150. 150. He has one box. He has 150 cards. Okay, how about the second friend? The uh, second friend, well, he has 150 and 150 and 150 more. He has 450. 450. Mary Sella, what did you do to get that number 450? Because uh, each square is just 150 cards. Mm -hmm. 150 yeah. times 3 or 150 plus 150 plus 150 gave me 450. Then how about this third guy? Well, this first box is worth 150 and then he also had 100 more. So he has 250. 250. 100 more than 150. And it's a visual representation of what would have been a kind of challenging algebra problem for a lot of people. Now, whether you realize it or not, we did algebra. We just used boxes instead of X's. Uh, but sometimes it's a lot easier for people to picture. Cool. Let's move on. The Johnsons purchased an above ground pool for the backyard. Now, I purposely didn't tell you what shape the pool was. I'm being a brat. The pool is 12 feet in diameter and should be filled six feet deep. How many cubic feet of water will it take to fill the pool? Now, like I said, I purposely did not tell you what shape the pool was, but there are some clues here. One of the clues is that it's an above ground pool. Most above ground pools are a certain shape, but maybe you've never seen an above ground pool. There's another clue here. I tell you that the pool is 12 feet in diameter. What do y'all think this pool is shaped like? Circle. Definitely there's something circular going on. That word diameter implies that I've got a circle going on. So, uh, but I've kind of flattened out my circle because I know that a pool has got to be three dimensional, right? A pool is not just a 2D shape or we wouldn't be able to fill it with water. And so I'm gonna bring it down for some depth here and it's gonna end up looking like a- Cylinder. Cylinder, wonderful. So definitely the circle going on because of that word diameter. So my pool I say is 12 feet in diameter. And we said a diameter goes from one end of the circle to the other through the center. And my circle again got distorted because I'm looking at it 3D and it should be filled six feet deep. So I'm filling it six feet deep. So now let's get to the question. It says how many cubic feet of water? Oh my gosh, we've talked about linear feet today, lines. We've talked about square feet today, but we haven't talked about cubic feet. Does anybody know what cubic feet are? It has a length, a height, and a, and a width. Exactly. There you go. It's a one by one by one foot cube. It goes off in three dimensions, one foot. We have a cube. So we're asking how many of these little cubes it would take to fill up this pool. Anybody know when we measure cubic feet what we're talking about? So we said, um, we said regular feet would be like um, perimeter or circumference. Square feet would be like area. But now I'm talking cubic feet. What's measured in cubic units? Take note of this. This is super important, guys. If I want to like fill up my water bottle, if I had a bunch of flat paper squares, it'd be really hard to count. I wouldn't want squares. I want cubes that I could stack up in my water bottle, okay? So same difference. When I try to fill up a three-dimensional shape uh, with cubes, that's called volume. Like I'll say, what's the volume of your water bottle? Or they even talk about refrigerators, you know they'll say how many cubic feet of space are in a refrigerator when you go to read the specs on your fridge. So when you're trying to fill something up, that's known as volume. So let's hit up the GED formula sheet. We need the volume of a 
cylinder you guys told me this was formula to the whole internet if you don't have it go open up another tab, tab of your web browser and google ged formula sheet it's the first thing that comes up but you're going to see that the volume of a cylinder is equal to pi r squared h so all we have to do is plug into this formula so we already know what pi is we keep talking about the, that today uh, pi is approximately 3.14 we also know what r stands for you guys told me what r stood for when we did our circle problem what does r stand for radius radius uh oh i'm in trouble i don't know the radius of my cylinder yes you do yes i do says richard richard what's the radius of my cylinder six feet how come it's six feet because it's half the diameter because it's half the diameter beautiful so i'll plug in a six for my radius and then what's the height of my cylinder here six feet exactly that depth that i was filling is that six foot high six foot deep same difference and now i can type this entire expression into my ti calculator 3.14 times six and don't forget to square it times six again and i get something nice and nasty 678.24 and again, cubic feet. And again, I didn't give rounding directions like a slacker. So if this was on the GED, it would be a multiple choice. You're probably mad at me because I cheated. You cheated. You didn't cheat. You just went a different way. I did the area of the circle and then multiplied it by six, which is the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. This is pi r squared is the area of the circle and then multiply it by the height. So right. what you're doing, Richard, if you were to look at the GED formula sheet, is you're using the method that they call volume of a right prism. When you find the volume of a right prism, you just find the area of the base shape, so in this case a circle, and then multiply by the height. So you're absolutely doing fine math. Why at the end we put the three? Oh, this is the abbreviation for cubic feet. Remember that we said that little floating three was abbreviated cube? Mathematicians mm -hmm. are so lazy, we don't like to spell. We're always trying to abbreviate. So feet to the third power is the abbreviation for cubic feet. It's not math to do. It's just me shortcut writing uh, the unit there. So this is a cubic foot. It's something that's one foot by one foot by one foot. So that's how many. It would take 678 of these little cubes to fill up my pool. And um, of course, we know that because it's a round pool, we'd have pieces and parts of them all over. And that's why we need that formula to help us. Mm -hmm. I just use the abbreviation of CF. Cubic feet? Yeah, like this. They probably wouldn't use that on the GED. That's an industry standard, but it means the same thing. So as long as you recognize that mine means the same as yours, you won't be in trouble. Yeah, because I use the industry standard of cubic feet like that, yeah. or cubic inches, CI yeah. for cubic inches. Another common, common one is CC, cubic right. centimeters. cubic centimeters. Those are used all the time in medicine. So yeah, it's, that's cool. Mathematicians usually use the abbreviation for the unit with the floating number on top, you know, the exponent. But since they mean the same thing, I don't really care. We're, we're talking about the same thing. We're just using different abbreviations because of our different industries. Right, okay. right, right. I'm using an automotive industry kind of thing where things are measured in cubic, cubic centimeters and cubic feet and cubic inches. I'm so glad you brought that up because really things play out differently in different industries all the time. You know, I had a student who, who shouted out in the middle of my decimal lecture the other day, you mean thousands? Um, because he's in machining and they, they don't say thousandths of an inch, they say thous. And I was like, okay, yeah, I mean thous. Well, I just didn't, I wasn't sure that if I wrote that CF on the test, if I would get the answer wrong, even Good though my question. calculations were correct. On the test, it would either be multiple choice, so you just have to pick out yours, or the only fill in the blank part would be the number. So you just have to fill in the number part. Okay. So they're not, because they know that different industries use different abbreviations. They're not trying to trick you with something like that. Oh, cool. Only three left. And these three, by the way, are advanced practice. All of them require prior stuff. If you're going to go practice this um, on the homework today, these are all on the advanced level practice. So I recognize that it's not just a diagram going on here, but I'm still going to show you that even in advanced math, I use pictures to figure out what's going on. So let's look at 11. It says a painter leans a 14 foot extension ladder against a wall. If the bottom of the ladder is placed three feet from the base of the wall, how high up the wall will the ladder reach? So I know a few things. I know the length of my ladder. I know that my ladder's leaning against a wall. I know how far away the bottom of my ladder is from the base of the wall. And I'm, no, I'm trying to find how high up the wall the ladder will reach. 
So I'm going to look at this from the side view because it's just going to help me better to understand my problem. Here's my wall. Let's lean a ladder up against it. Label what we know. It says the painter leans a 14 foot extension ladder against a wall. Okie dokie, my ladder is 14 feet long. Then it says the bottom of the ladder is placed three feet from the base of the wall. Okay, so the bottom of the ladder from the base of the wall right here, this is three feet. And now the question they're asking me is how high up the wall will the ladder reach? You guys, that looks like a shape to me that I know. <laughs> what, what shape does that look like to you? Triangle. A triangle. And it's not just any triangle. Right I'm going to assume that my wall, like most walls, so I'm going to assume that this is making a nice right angle and that this is a right triangle. We get to assume all the walls in our math problems are straight up and down. We have good carpenter. Look at this. I know two sides of a right triangle and I'm trying to find the third. Let me just jot that down. And I'm trying to find a third. Oh my goodness. There's an actual relationship, a formula on the formula sheet that tells you about the three sides of a right triangle. It's uh, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. C That's squared right. That sucker is known as the Pythagorean theorem. Good job, Richard. Yeah, that was the word I learned again. <laughs> yeah. So the Pythagorean theorem. So Mary Sally, you might want to write that down. It's on your GED formula sheet, but it's known as the Pythagorean theorem. And it gives the relationship of the three sides of a right triangle. And like Richard said, what it says is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, a couple of super important things that you need to know. So I would write this right on my formula sheet if you don't know it. A and B are the legs of my my right triangle. See the legs form an L around the right angle. Legs L. <laughs> And then the C is the hypotenuse. It's the side across. And we did all of this in our video on the Pythagorean theorem. So you can see a full length class video on this if you want. But I did not know that I needed the Pythagorean theorem here until I visualized this. Let's plug in what we know. So remember I said that the legs were made an L among the right angle. So here are the legs of my right triangle. I know one of them, three feet, but I don't know the other one. The other one's a mystery, so it will remain a letter. I will turn my A into three. I'll keep my square square, my plus, and my square. My C, my side across from the right angle, is 14. So I'll plug in 14 for C, and the 14 is supposed to be squared. Take a look at this algebra equation that I've substituted in now. Do you see any straightforward math that I know how to do? Any simplifying? To so look on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, do you see any expressions I know how to simplify? Can we simplify three? Yes, I can do three squared. Three so three squared. squared or three times three is nine. I'll leave my plus. I'll leave my b squared. How about on the right hand side? Do you see anything you know how to simplify there? Yes, and I can use a calculator to do it if I'm not sure, but 14 squared is 196. And I simplified. And I'm just going to copy it down here so I have some more room to work. Okay, cool. Now, there's no more simplifying I can do. There's no more work on the left I know how to do. There's no more work on the right that I know how to do. It's time to start solving and working to get b alone. Mary Silla, do you know what I should do to start solving this equation? Nine. Yes, I'm going to move the nine. I'm going to move them away through subtract since he's a positive number over there adding with b. And I get b squared is equal to uh, 187. Cool, and I'm almost done, but now I have to get rid of a square. Do you remember what the opposite of square is? Um, divide. It's not divide. Divide is the opposite of multiply. Remember, add is the opposite of subtract. Multiply and divide are opposites. But what is the opposite of square? Uh, square root. Square root, exactly. If I want to get rid of a square, I got to do the opposite of square. That's square root. And of course, we know that if we're solving, we're doing it to both sides. So on this side, square and square root cancel, so that my b is alone. And on that side, I'll take the square root root of 187 and I get 13.67 yada 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 yada. I'll just say this for the sake of everybody on the internet. When your brain is thinking real hard about algebra and geometry and word problems, we had all three in this problem. As complex as we're going to get, algebra, geometry, word problems, all the things. Yeah, use the calculator to do the arithmetic. It's so easy to make a stupid arithmetic error when our brains are just really working hard at the more complex stuff. So boom, I get about 13.67 and there are, again, are no rounding directions. So I'm just going to say that's about 13.67 feet. That was a review of everything we've ever done in this class. So if you felt like that was hard, it, it was. So I'm just going to clear this so that I can have space to work number 12. Ming is a tutor. When she works seven hours, she makes $175. When she works five hours, she makes $125. If she were to graph her earnings on a graph, what would be the slope of the resultant line? Slope is the GED's favorite topic, and a lot of students panic at the sight of slope. There's formulas for it, but what I want you guys to realize is we could 
picture this. We could draw this on a graph. It says if she were to graph her earnings on a graph. So if you're not sure what to do. I'm not real sure about this because it doesn't really say what earnings. It doesn't say if it's her hourly earnings or it doesn't say if it's her total earnings. It just says her earnings. And yeah. based on that, based on her total earnings, the graph would be different than if it was based on her hourly earnings. Well, what, did you notice here that we have two variables? Every time we see the relationship with earnings, Earnings, we see a relationship between hours and dollars. So like the first time it says when she works seven hours, she makes $175. And then we right. see when she works five hours, she makes $125. Right. So I'm going to put this on a graph that has two variables that charts the hours with the dollars. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need to be able to get up to seven hours. Okay. So we're working five hours. We're working seven hours. It looks like I could count by 25s and get these. So I'm going to do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. 25, 50, 70. 75, 100, 125, 150, 175. Cool, I'm high enough. And that by ones. One, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven. So when she works seven hours, she makes $175. So seven hours uh, graphs with $175. I'm going to draw a point between seven and 175. And then it says when she works five hours, she makes $125. So five hours to $125. And then we want to find the slope of the line. And now you have to have some information about slope. You have to know what slope is. Does anybody remember what slope is? Slope is the remember. ratio. So guys, ratio means fraction of change in Y, and we often called that the rise over the run. In fact, when we were learning slope, we often said, oh, it's just rise over run. The ratio make a fraction out of the rise over the run. So let's take a look at these two points. If I wanted to go from this point to this point, I'd have to rise. How much am I rising? How much am I going up if I go up from 125 to 175? 50. 50, exactly. And that's supposed to be my rise over my run. So how much am I running? Well, I went from five to seven. How much is that? Two. Two. So this is a ratio, a fraction of the rise over the run. It's 50 over two. And as Mary Sella pointed out, that divides perfectly. That's just 25. What would be the slope of the resultant line? It would be 25. If you are sitting here listening to this number 12 and going, Kate, I have no idea what slope is, then you are actually at a very big disadvantage for the GED because slope is the GED's favorite topic. They like to hide it in word problems. They like to put it in graphs. They like to have it in equations. They have slope in every form you could possibly imagine. So I highly recommend that you do the unit that we have in our class that has slope in it. It's the functions unit, guys. It has five or six different videos on slope to see it in all its different applications. So number 13 is re very, very typical of the science test. It's actually math that shows up on the science test. But once again, it's something that we address with a picture. Okay, so let's take a look at 13. It said, a heterozygous black cat and a homozygous recessive white cat are bred. Use a Punnett square to determine the percent chance of their offspring being born black. So ever since Richard saw this set, he's been mad at me probably because I'm using some science language that I didn't define. There's very few words you have to have memorized for the science test, but we have said multiple times that some of the stuff you should definitely know have to do with this inheritability of genes, inheriting genes. When we did this in the probability lesson, I actually stopped, highlighted these words for you and wrote down all the definitions and said, you must know these words for the test. Basically, when you're when you get your genes, you get one set from your mom and one set from your dad. So for every trait, you're going to have one bit of information from your mom, one bit of information from your dad. Okay, so heterozygous means that your mom and dad gave different info. They call that alleles. So if you're heterozygous, like maybe your your dad's genes said give her brown eyes, and your mom's genes said give her blue eyes. Yeah, if you're homozygous, it means that your parents' genes said the same thing. So you ended up with the same allele. So like mom and dad both said blue or mom and dad both said brown. So I'm saying it's <laughs> a heterozygous black cat. That means the cat is black, but two different alleles in his gene pair. So he has black and something else. And then I see a homozygous recessive white cat. So homozygous means her genes are the same. So if she's white, both her mother and her father gave her white genes. So we're supposed to use a Punnett square to determine the percent chance of their offspring being born black. Again, this particular lesson is just about drawing pictures. So if you need a full length lesson on 
Punnett squares, again, go check out that probability video. We talk a lot about it there. But do either of you guys remember what a Punnett square looks like? Well, like its name, it starts as a square. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I cheated and went on the internet yesterday. Looked up a Punnett square. Well, good for you, Richard, because guess what? The GED loves friggin' Punnett squares. If you don't see one on it, I'll bet you five bucks you see one on your science test, okay? Now, if I'm wrong. Five bucks? You want to make it ten? No, I don't. I'm so poor. Richard, I have six kids. I'm regretting the five bucks, okay? I, I take it all back. Um, what we're going to do with the Punnett square is we're going to give two columns for the two alleles from mom and, and two rows for the two, two alleles from another parent. So we'll put a parent on the top of rows and we'll put a parent here along the side of the square. Let's go to our homozygous recessive white cat. We said if she was homozygous, her genes were the same thing. They're both recessive white W, lowercase w. For recessive, we typically use lowercase letters. Again, I am doing this problem with the assumption that all of you have done Punnett squares in the past. Now, looking up at the top here, we see we have a heterozygous black cat. So I told you a heterozygous has two different alleles, black and something. Well, in this case, we know what the recessive is now. We know it's white. That cat must have a black and a white. Now, usually they use the same letter, but it won't matter at all. So now I have the parent number one across one side and the parent number two across the other side. And now we'll do it like a times table. A big B from the top, little W here. This one would also give me a big B, little W. This one would give me a little w little w and this one would give me a little w little w wonderful so i have four possible offspring gene combinations my offspring could end up getting a, a big b from dad and a, d a little w from mom or a black gene and a white gene black gene and a white gene or two white genes two white genes and we're looking for the percent chance of their offspring being born black well obviously these two cats are not going to be born black because all they have is white genes but the other two it's a little confusing they have a black allele and a white allele what color would they be Gray. Yes. We think they'd be gray, but in this case, when I use the language, when I use the language um, dominant or recessive, yeah, Mary Cell is right. They'd be black. When you have a trait that's dominant or recessive, it wins. It doesn't mix. It wins. So the big letter will win. That's why we use capital letters to signify this. So if you have a black gene and a white gene, in this case, I would have a black cat. Now, Richard, you're thinking, hey, in the real world, we get gray cats. Yeah, that's because Kate made up this problem. I don't know if this is really a gene that behaves this way. Okie dokie. <laughs> but if they use that language dominant or recessive, then you need to know that the big capital letters always win if they get in a battle with the little letters. Okay, so that means two out of every four offspring will end up being black because two of those had that black white combination, they would end up being black cats. But I wanted the percent chance of their offspring being born black. Two out of four is what percent? 50%. <laughs> two out of four would be 50%. And you only ever have 25, 50, or 75% with these simple Punnett squares. So you don't have to know hard percents. So that's what happened with my mom's cat because she has black cat. She has a black cat? Yes, she has three. Oh, well, cool. So maybe this did happen. Mary Cell is like, I have prior knowledge to latch this. <laughs> this is only one type of heredity. They call it a um, Mendelian genetics. This is only one way for genes to get passed with recessive and dominant, but it's the only way on the GED. So when I talk to you about it, it seems like all genes are passed this way, but that's not true. If you guys were to go into high science, you would learn all different ways about genes being passed. But this is just a really simple one to, to figure out, even for beginner students. So we often start with this type of gen genetics when we talk about it with students. I highly recommend, as always, that you go practice this topic because if you don't practice something, you won't have a test taking knowledge of it. There are three levels of practice, a beginning, an experience, and advanced level. Again, the goal here is mostly for us to draw pictures, but as you go up through the experience and advanced level practice, you're gonna find some pretty challenging GED style problems that would require some background knowledge there. Thank you so much for joining me today for our virtual GED class where we talked about visualizing word problems. Next week, we're going to draw out another skill from word problems here. Continue to build our arsenal of tools so that when we go to attack the very diverse word problems on the GED, we have all our problem solving strategies at the ready. So see you next week.